Hey y'all, hope you're doing well, um, and I hope you're getting ready for the end of the semester. We're about to head into our last unit of information, um, stuff for our last lecture test five, hot diggity doggity, um, and so we are going to go into the urinary system for chapter 24, and then we're also going to pick up after urinary and talk about some uh, balances, fluid and electrolyte balances, and acid-base balance in chapter 25, and then we're going to wrap it up with chapter 28 being reproduction and I'm going to add some of chapter 29 into our chapter 28 information but we're not really going to cover most of chapter 29 and I'm going to kind of abridge and shorten m most of these chapters overall. Um, I'm going to be using some older presentations and again I'm going to be modifying the test to make sure that it's directed towards these presentations and these presentations are kind of directed with the same information that I have um, available for the um, notes and the study questions. So um, that kind of syncs it back on how we would do it a little bit better in class. And I'll make sure that I get those things put up on Blackboard as soon as possible. So let's talk about the urinary system. Don't forget, urinary system, we've already covered it in lab. The urinary system is a system that filters waste from the bloodstream, but actually what it's doing is it's filtering water and anything small enough to get out of the capillaries out of the bloodstream. So it's not just waste, it's filtering a lot of things out, but in the process it's going to have to reabsorb most of those things back into the body to keep them. So things like sugar um, and salts, so sodium and potassium and chloride and things like that, then you know our electrolytes, then we're going to want to keep those as well. And so we're going to see that the urinary system, what it's trying to do is it's trying to remove the waste but it wants to keep as much good stuff as possible. So we are filtering waste from the bloodstream, but then we're creating a waste product that loses as little good stuff as possible. So that's really what this urinary system is doing, is making sure that we're condensing that waste and putting as much waste with as little water and as little other things in the urine as possible, because we don't want to just lose those things uh, unnecessarily. So here, real quick, some general functions. If we're looking in our textbook, we can see on, um, let me come find the page for the beginning of chapter 24, but they also list some excellent functions over here on page 955. And whenever we look over here, we can see, um, and I'll mention this because there's going to be several different functions overall. Uh, first off, I'll cover the ones on the screen, and then I'll switch back over here to page 955 in your textbook and kind of talk about those real quick. So when we're looking here, first off, general functions of the kidney. Uh, I like to call these general functions. The first is obviously excretion. We're trying to remove the waste from the body, right? So if we can get it out of the bloodstream and into some tubes that are connected to the outside, then that means that we've removed it from the body. Not actually from the body itself, but from the bloodstream, right? And so excretion is removal of waste from the cells and then removal of waste from the bloodstream. And that's what the kidneys are going to do. So whenever we look at the main components of the urinary system, we're going to see the kidneys are going to be the primary functioning kind of structure, which is actually going to filter that waste from the bloodstream. And then we're going to have the urinary tract, and that's going to be our ureters and then the bladder and then the urethra. Again, the ureters connect the, the kidneys to the bladder and the urethra connects the bladder to the outside. So that's what the next big function is, elimination. So that's removal of the waste actually out of the body itself, right? Not out of the blood, but out of the actual body. And so that's what the urinary tract is going to be responsible for. And again, that's the other components of the urinary system besides the kidney. In the long run, and this is really what I want us to focus on for this class, is that the the main goal of the urinary system is homeostasis of blood plasma. The goal is to balance the fluid in our bloodstream, right? That's what it's trying to do is keep the balance of that fluid in blood. And then we're going to focus on two main things. We're going to focus on number one, how much volume, right? So how much total do we have? Because we're going to find out that the amount of blood and your blood pressure 
are correlated. And so if you've got more blood inside your bloodstream, more volume, then you're going to have a higher pressure. And if you've got less volume, you're going to have less pressure. So dehydration is going to drop your pressure and overhydration is going to increase the pressure, for example. And that's really what we're talking about here is hydration when we're talking about volume because we are looking at how much water is in the plasma. Then we're looking at the other stuff that's in the plasma, the solutes, remember these are things like sugars and nutrients and ions and electrolytes and all those good things. So the solutes, we're going to pay attention to the waste. We're going to pay attention to the nutrients, right? So everything, we've got to balance the blood plasma to make sure that it's got the proper nutrients and it doesn't have excess waste. And so all the things that we're doing in the process of, of urine formation and in this urinary chapter are all going to keep coming back to homeostasis of blood plasma, right? Now, if we look in our textbook, the textbook is going to list a few other functions. And so let's talk about those real quick. First off, it talks about elimination of metabolic waste. Don't forget that the waste that we are removing out of the bloodstream is due to metabolism. And we just finished talking about metabolism in our previous chapter. And that's one way that we're leading into this chapter. So the products of metabolism, we talked about urea, for example, um, due to deamination of proteins. And so um, we are going to need to get that metabolic waste out. Again, this is not indigestibles. That's what forms feces. If we absorb it into our bloodstream and then we use it for chemistry and it's a leftover product that's not a good thing or it doesn't need to build up in our body and we can't use it, then we're going to get it. Another thing is to regulate ion levels. And so I've already mentioned this. This is talking about the solute concentration, especially when we talk about ions. We're talking about the things involved with action potentials and with muscle contractions. And so here we're looking at all those sodium, potassium, calcium, those sorts of things, phosphates, you know, those are things that we really want to pay attention to. We're also going to regulate acid-base balance. Again, acid-base balance has to do with the amount of hydrogens in the fluid, and so there's another solute that we need to pay attention to is hydrogens because those hydrogens, too much of them, drops that pH, creates a negative environment, creates a place where we're going to break down instead of letting things work naturally. Um, again, I talked about blood volume and helping regulate blood pressure at the same time. Um, and then also some other things like hormones and drugs, they call them biologically active molecules. These guys are filtered out because they shouldn't stay in the system all the time necessarily. Now, let's move on. Um, and let's take a look at the basics. So here is the kidney. So here is what's going to do the actual filtration and do the urine production. And then we've got the ureter and, and the bladder and the urethra. And these are the urinary tract that's going to move the urine out of the body. Here we can kind of see just an image. Um, and these are from an older textbook. So I'm going to switch to these images from the older textbook and just kind of show these um, because we don't really have images on our lecture test anyway. And so, um, but these are just as good as the ones that's in our textbook here. We can see the kidneys are located around your lowest rib. Um, so sometimes you see people holding their low back, like, oh, I got kidney pain. It's like, no, 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 homie, it's up here. You know, so um, here's your kidneys kind of centered around those lowest ribs. Uh, again, the adrenals are on top. And in lab, we even kind of saw a view similar to this in your lab manual, page 91. That's got the abdominal aorta and the inferior vena cava. We can see the renal artery and renal vein. And then we can even see this ureter and the bladder and kind of the urethra. This is not the best view to see the urethra since it comes out the front. Um, here's another view just to kind of show us. It's kind of somewhat in line with a little bit of the pancreas over here and also the spleen. So kind of behind, we call it retroperitoneal, kind of behind the um, pancreas and the spleen is going to be this left kidney over here. So just kind of some views. Here again, we see another view. There's our psoas major and our iliacus, some of those muscles we remember from last semester. And we see some of this um, ureter, bladder, kidney structures. Now, this is kind of just a slide with a whole bunch of terms on it. So we're going to take some time. We're going to go through these words. A little bit of this is anatomy, but I want to relate it to the physiology right now. So I want to relate it to its function and not just its structure. So first off, a lot of this stuff over here is basic, but this stuff over here with this nephron, this is where we're going to 
really earn our money today. All right, so this is where we need to take the best notes. Hylus, Hylum, you know what that is. That's our plug-in. So this is where the renal artery and vein are going to enter, but also the ureter is going to exit the kidney. And I can show you some images here in just a second. <clears throat> For example, here is a good image that's going to show the um, hilus or the hilum, and that's this ringed region. And so this ringed region is kind of showing us this is where these things are plugging in. We don't see the artery in the vein here, but there is that ureter coming out. Um, back up here, we've got the renal sinus, and this is something that I'm not going to um, hound very much. We marked it out of lab not too long ago, um, but the renal sinus is a hollow region on the inside of the kidney. Um, it's where we have our collecting tube, not the collecting tubes, but the actual funnels that collect the urine and turn it into the ureter. So this is the region that surrounds the minor and the major calyxes and the renal pelvis. The key is usually we fill this up with fat. Again, look at this picture. Here we see adipose in that renal sinus. This is an open cavity, and so if we have any jarring accidents, then we could damage these tubes by banging them against something on the inside if we don't add some bubble wrap. So we're going to put some of that adipose, that liquid-filled bubble wrap, surrounding all of that um, renal sinus area, and that way it's not going to give us any problems if we do have um, some sort of accident. We don't need a renal concussion, right? And so that's kind of what that would become. The cortex versus the medulla. Again, let's jump over here and let's point that out. Here is, don't forget the capsule. The renal capsule is always the outer. And then we have the renal cortex. And the cortex is the outer region, not the outer layer, but the outer region. I want you to be familiar that this is where we have most of our nephrons. This is where we have most of our filtration units. So really, overall, a general function of the cortex is this is where filtration takes place. The cortex is the site of filtration, another way to say it. Towards the inside, we see these um, more darker colored regions, and they are little triangles. The whole area is called the renal medulla, and each of these is called a renal pyramid. So we covered this in lab. The renal medulla is kind of the whole region, and each slice of pie is a renal pyramid. And so here what we're really seeing is kind of collecting. We're collecting the urine, and we're about to drip it out of that papilla into this minor and then major calyx and then into the renal renal pelvis before it's out into the ureter. And so when we look at the medulla, its general function is for collecting urine overall. And also, it's also where we're going to really kind of route a lot of the blood vessels through. Okay. Um, now, when we we have these other terms here, juxtaglomerular apparatus and cortical nephron um, and juxtamedullary nephron. Let me see if I can get those first. Here is cortical nephron versus juxtamedullary nephron. Again, that cortical nephron, it's mainly in the cortex, and a juxtamedullary nephron has a longer loop. We'll talk about this loop Henley. This longer loop of Henley that comes down into the medulla or the medullary region. And so this guy, we haven't talked about it yet, but we did in lab. These loops, these long loops, these are what super concentrate the urine. And so as a result, this juxtamedullary nephron, I want you to know its function is to super concentrate the urine compared to our cortical nephrons. Now, we've, we've been told that most of our nephrons are cortical, but we've got some of these juxtamedullary, and they just kind of do a little extra concentration of that urine. Um, let's look here. This is going to be our renal corpuscle, and again, we've talked about this in lab, so this hopefully isn't new information, but here is the beginning of our nephron, and we mentioned this in lab. The juxtaglomerular apparatus is located right here. Um, I gave it to you in a different picture on the model, um, and it was kind of flipped so that this tube was at the top, but the whole key, that juxtaglomerular apparatus, its importance, its function is juxtaglomerular apparatus. Again, I like to say JGA. This is the endocrine component of the kidney. So this is where we're actually going to make some of the hormones, especially erythropoietin and renin. Okay, so we're going to make those guys in that juxtaglomerular apparatus or the JGA 
Renin is going to help control blood pressure, and erythropoietin helps to create new red blood cells. And we've kind of already talked about that um, back in our chapter 17. Now let's focus on this nephron. Again, a nephron is the basic filtration unit of the kidney. So this is the main filtering structure in the kidney. But what I want you to understand is there's not just one of these. These are microscopically tiny. There are approximately one and a quarter million nephrons in each of your kidneys. So for both of your kidneys combined, you got two and a half million nephrons. So that's a lot. So these nephrons, these are the filtration units. If you've ever heard of nephritis, that means inflammation of these. That's a kidney inflammation, a kidney disorder. Um, you know, you may have heard of a nephrotoxin, something that destroys the kidneys, like mushrooms are notorious for creating nephrotoxins. So that nephro is a reference to the kidney and especially to this nephron, the basic filtration unit. We've got two main components of a nephron. I'm going to talk about all of these parts and then I'm going to go show them to you because what I really want you to do right now is not focus on the anatomy but focus on the physiology. All right, The renal corpuscle, the function of the renal corpuscle, again this is kind of the head of the snake if we think of a nephron as being this twisted up snake. The head of the snake is the renal corpuscle. The importance of the renal corpuscle is this is where filtration takes place. So this is actually where filtration truly takes place and filtration takes place through these capillaries called the glomerulus or the glomerular capillaries. So these capillaries are where filtration occurs. We're going to filter based on size. If you are, this is really just kind of a net what this glomerulus is. You can think about that. It's a, it's a capillary bed, but it's kind of got this net wrapped around it. And so if you are small enough to fit through that net, then you will leave the bloodstream and you will enter uh, the tubules, the nephron, and now you have the possibility of becoming urine. So the glomerulus is where we get fluid and solutes out of the bloodstream and now we can start working with it so it can eventually become urine. And so what we mean by filtration. Filtration is one of the three major major physiological components of urine formation. So we'll talk about that. Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule is what surrounds the glomerulus and Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule catches the filtrate. Here I'm going to give you a visual real quick. So here is the glomerulus. These squiggled up um, capillaries are the glomerulus. And here you can almost kind of see this net and how only the red regions are where we can get out. So if you're small enough to get out, then you get out. So water and even good stuff, not just waste, but good stuff, sugars and salts, they get out too because they're that small. And so here is Bowman's capsule, this purple shell that kind of surrounds it. And what happens is the inside of that shell is called the capsular space. So we're going to catch that fluid that comes out of these two, these um, squiggles, these nets and the glomerulus catch it here in the capsular space and then we're going to start to move it out through this proximal convoluted tubule. Okay, So here is a good image of the renal corpuscle and again the renal corpuscle is kind of the head of the snake if we think about this nephron is kind of looking like a snake. Now the renal tubules, we just said that the glomerulus is going to perform filtration. I want you to know that the fluid that comes out of the glomerulus and gets caught inside Bowman's capsule and then enter the renal tubules, that fluid is called filtrate. So filtrate, F-I-L-T-R-A-T-E. Filtrate is what comes out of the glomerulus. So I want you to know that the renal tubules are going to adjust filtrate to produce urine. So they're going to take what comes out of the glomerulus and they're going to turn it into what comes out of your body. They're going to turn it into the actual urine, the waste product that we're going to release. So the renal tubules, again, they adjust filtrate to produce the urine. We've got a total of four different tubes or tubules that we're going um, to be involved with these processes. And here at the renal tubules, I want you to go ahead and take down a note that we've got two, the two other main physiological processes involved with urine formation. Up here I mentioned filtration, right? So moving things out based on size. Down here we're going to have two new terms. We're going to have reabsorption and secretion. So down here we're going to talk about reabsorption. I need for you to understand that reabsorption is regaining the good stuff 
that's in the tubes, that's in this filtrate, and putting it out of the tubes so that we can reabsorb it into our bloodstream. So reabsorption is what we're going to do with good stuff. Stuff that we want to keep, we're going to reabsorb. Another way to think about it is the fluid inside the tubules is called tubular fluid. The fluid on the outside of the tubules is called paratubular fluid. And so the Reabsorption is going to take things from the tubular fluid and put them into the paratubular fluid and then put them into capillaries so they're back in the body. So reabsorption is getting good stuff back into our body, back into our bloodstream. Secretion is what we're going to do with some bad stuff. Secretion is what we do with waste that was too big to get filtered. So secretion, if you were too big to fit through that glomerulus, fit through the net, then you're going to stay in the bloodstream. So now we're going to secrete bad stuff, secrete waste that wasn't filtered. That's what secretion is. Now I want you to understand, kind of like we did with reabsorption, secretion, we're going to take it from the capillaries, and then we're going to put it into the paratubular fluid, P-E-R-I, tubular fluid, and then we're going to put it into the tubular fluid. And now what we've done is we've taken it from the bloodstream, and we've put it into the tubes, and now it's going to be taken out with the rest of the urine. So we've got five of these, excuse me, four of these tubes, and I want you to know some of the basic functions for each. The proximal convoluted tubule, or the PCT, its primary function is reabsorption. Here we're going to reabsorb water, and we're going to reabsorb a lot of our nutrients, and well, we should reabsorb 100% of our nutrients, and we should reabsorb a lot of our, our salts, a lot of our ions. So the PCT is mainly involved with reabsorption. So we're going to reabsorb as much as we can, and then we send the rest of that fluid to the loop of Henley. Now about 50 to 6, 40 to 50 percent of the fluid that we filtered actually reaches here. So we're going to reabsorb most, you know, a little bit more than half here at the beginning. At the loop of Henley, we're going to try to reabsorb as much of that as we can still. So loop of Henley, further reabsorption of water and ions, water and salts. And so the loop of Henley, what it's trying to do in the long run is it's trying to further reabsorb some water and some salts, but what that does is it concentrates the urine. So the loop of Henley's main job is to concentrate the urine. This is why if you are a juxtamedullary nephron and you have a longer loop of Henley, then you super concentrate the urine because you've got more area to concentrate, so you do more of a concentration of that urine if you've got a longer loop. Now, at that point, we've reabsorbed practically... 85% of the fluid, 80, and we've reabsorbed almost everything good that we need. We're going to keep reabsorbing water and, and whatever else we can down into the distal convoluted tubule, but I want you to realize that the primary function of the distal convoluted tubule is this is our main site for secretion. This is the main place that we can get the bad stuff that wasn't filtered back into the tubular fluid and now it's going to be on its way out to become urine because the tubular fluid will become urine. Um, the collecting tubes, we're going to have multiple of these distal convoluted tubules connecting into one collecting tubule. So the collecting tubule is really not a component of the renal tubules, but it is. So the last part of the renal tubules that's part of the nephron is the DCT, but then the DCTs of multiple nephrons connect to collecting tubules. And these collecting tubules, their job is to do the final urine adjustments. So these collecting tubules, these guys are going to do our final urine adjustments. We can do our last bit of regaining water and trying to regain any other salts or sodium or whatever. And we can also try to put any bit of waste that's left um, in at this region if possible. So again, here we're kind of seeing set up how we've got our nephron, renal 
corpuscle is the head of the snake, and that's where we make filtrate. So that's the site of filtration. Then we have a proximal convoluted tubule, a loop of Henle, and a distal convoluted tubule. You see at the PCT, reabsorption of water, it's missing a comma, comma ions and all organic nutrients. At the loop of Henle, we're going to further reabsorb water and salt, sodium and chloride. And then at the DCT, we're going to keep reabsorbing, but we're also now going to focus on secretion. This is our primary site for secretion of things that did not get filtered. And then we hit here, and we get our last bit of adjustment of water, of pH, of any of the last bit of ions that we've got before it hits the minor K. It comes out of the renal papilla, and there the urine is formed. Okay, so there again is our uh, cortical versus juxtamedullary. Here's something that we didn't see in lab, and here's those paratubular capillaries. I kind of alluded to it that we have an afferent arterial that comes in. Here's our glomerulus. They're just labeling it renal corpuscle, but there's the glomerulus, and then we have our efferent arterial that comes out, and it wraps all the way around again an arterial to an arterial, and that's not normal. This should be a venule, right, if we just left a capillary. But what we're doing is actually making a tiny portal system, this capillary, the glomerulus, to these capillaries, the paratubulars. So the efferent arterial creates the paratubular capillaries, and these are the capillaries I was just talking about that we can either reabsorb into to keep the good stuff, or we can take the bad stuff out of these capillaries, put it into the fluid, paratubular fluid surrounding the tubes and then suck it in, secrete it into the actual tubes and then it's on its way out to eventually become urine. Okay, so here's a good view of those tubular capillaries. Again, that's what this efferent arterial is going to wrap around and become are those paratubulars before it becomes the actual vein. Now again, here's another introduction, um, and we're going to kind of move a little bit quicker through slides at this point because that, that one slide took us a long time to cover a lot of good information. Some of this is actually covering what I just mentioned also as some of the functions out of the textbook. Here's just a fact. We're going to make a lot of waste um, whenever we undergo... Um, metabolism. We've already seen C6H12O6 plus O2 gives us CO2 plus H2O. Well, there's our CO2, right? Well, we've already talked the CO2. We take that to the lungs and we get rid of it, right? But we haven't talked about the rest of the waste. The rest of the waste that we create is what we're going to get rid of in urine. So again, this is metabolic waste through metabolism, the leftover stuff that we've created. So this is really kind of the job of the urinary system is to remove that waste, but it also has some other functions. Don't forget primary function, homeostasis of blood plasma. Keep that in your brain. Right? So here's some components of how we balance the fluid. Again, we balance how much and then how much pressure. So the volume and the pressure in the system. We also regulate some of our ions and electrolytes, sodium, potassium, chloride, um, calcium, uh, phosphates, you know, so those are our main five main ions. And so we're going to help regulate the solute concentration, be it ions or be it nutrients, right? So we're going to conserve nutrients as well. And we're going to get rid of waste. We're also going to be paying attention to the pH, the hydrogens, which is kind of considered another solute. But we're going to look at this blood pH to make sure everything's good. And I do want you to realize, and we kind of talked about this, that the kidneys help the liver. They detoxify the body by themselves. They can detoxify the stuff that they can grab a hold of and remove. But many times the liver helps to put toxins in a form that the kidneys can remove from the body. So the liver and the kidneys are always working together to detoxify the body overall. Now again, as I mentioned, the goal overall is to keep that balance. Okay. Now that's going to keep showing up, but let's focus right here on the metabolic waste. Here's our three most common metabolic waste products. And this actually, right, my apologies, this is misspelled. I didn't fix that and I should have. So this, this second one, if you're writing these down, it should be creatinine, right? Not creatine, but creatinine or creatinine. So creatinine or creatinine should have an extra I-N after this I-N. C-R-E-A-T-I-N-I-N-E. -I -I -E. Okay, creatinine or creatinine. 
Okay. First off, let's talk about urea though. This is the number one waste product in our urine. Urea, don't forget, is made from the breakdown of amino acids. Remember, this is created through deamination. And so we're doing this all the time. Remember, deamination can create some really bad compounds. It can really force the kidneys and liver to work over time. And so if you're working, uh, if you're on those carb high protein diets then you're really upping the amount of urea that's in your bloodstream and therefore in your in your urine and so your urine becomes more yellow this is the main yellow coloration and um, because you're creating you're getting rid of more waste products so again it tends to be from from proteins either breaking down most of our waste are from proteins either breaking down or building up which is kind of weird Creatinine, don't forget, creat creatine is actually a high energy molecule, creatine phosphate. We talked about this with muscles. Remember, your body stores as much as it can. It creates it and stores it in the muscles, and it just kind of revamps that ATP for an extra you know, 10 to 15 seconds. But here, creatinine with two INs, this is the byproduct, this is the waste product of creatine phosphate. So when we split creatine phosphate apart, the waste is called creatinine. And so, again, using our muscles, using proteins in our body, creates the second most abundant waste, creatinine. And so um, this is from the breakdown of that creatine phosphate. And this is another reason why you don't want to take that as a supplement. Um, you know, you take too much of that creatine phosphate trying to work out. A lot of bodybuilders might try to do that because it's really just a placebo. It makes them think that they can do more reps with more weight than they actually can, even though it really doesn't give them anything. It gives them a placebo. Your body makes stores as much of that creatine phosphate as possible. So whenever you take extra of this, you really just force your kidneys to get rid of it because it will just spill out in the kidneys as creatine phosphate and you'll just urinate it out. So that's not a good thing. Um, or your body will use it, you know, and release even more creatinine. Either way, that's not what the kidneys want to do. Um, I always tell this story. When I was at Clemson, there were two guys who were taking a lot of this powder, this creatine phosphate powder. I don't see these jugs, but these are like gallon-sized jugs of these powders. And people will make milkshakes out of them, things like that. Well, these kids were taking one of those gallon things a day. Those are supposed to last you a several weeks but they were eating one a day they did it for about a week two weeks and they found these two kids dead in their bed so these kids both died of acute renal failure in their sleep because they had taken too much of that supplement trying to work out trying to get big bodied right and look good for the ladies or something but then in the long run they just completely killed their kidneys and their kidneys shut down and they died of kidney failure in their sleep and they found them both on the same night, which is really kind of sad. Um, but it just shows you, hey, there's a good, it's a, a, an experiment, and no, a, not a good one, but it's a bad experiment because they died. But it shows you that both of them died on the same night, so from taking the same amounts. And so the body does have toxic levels that it can reach. Uric acid. This is from the breakdown of using RNA. So using RNA to build proteins, take new proteins, we create uric acid. And this is acidic, right? Uric acid is actually, let's talk about bird turds, right? Let's talk about birds and reptiles because they are practically the same thing. Um, they both lay eggs and they both have one hole, a cloaca, where they release their waste and they have, you know, they reproduce and, and and everything. Um, they also, if you look at reptiles and birds, this is really crazy, but if you've never looked at this, a scale from a reptile, if you look at it under a microscope, it looks exactly like a feather that hasn't been fluffed apart yet. And so don't forget that dinosaurs became birds, right? So our reptiles and our birds, they're extremely closely related. Both have a lot of the same metabolic features. When we talk about these guys, and their waste product, think about a bird turd, right? And it's the same thing. If you've got an iguana at home or something like that, think about that pet's feces. They have the usual brown feces, but then they have this white stuff that's on top. The white stuff that's on top is the actual uric acid. So again, they have a cloaca. They don't have a, um, you know, a urethra and a rectum. And so they get rid of both at the same time. And so that's the reason, for example, if you have that bird turd on your car and you don't wash it off, then that uric acid will eat through your paint, 
right? And so we can see that in other animals, they have the same thing. And it is highly acidic. It's so acidic, it eats through your paint on your car if you don't take care of it, right? So kind of crazy. But that's something that's shared in a lot of species is that waste product. Now, as we've already mentioned, the waste is dissolved in the bloodstream after metabolism. We're going to take it to the kidneys, and we're going to create urine out of it. Now, here's the big deal, and here's what I was talking about earlier, is that there is an unavoidable water loss. So one of the goals of the kidneys is to concentrate the urine as much as possible to limit the water losses because we don't want to be constantly dehydrated. So the kidney's job is to prevent that, that chronic dehydration by limiting how much water we lose. Now urine is still 95% water and so there's still only small amounts of actual waste in it but we do concentrate it a lot more than plasma which is what we're filtering from. So we're going to concentrate it's more than four times because if we started with 50 gallons and we end than a gallon, then we've definitely concentrated that more than four times. Okay, the goal we're going to reabsorb the nutrients, reabsorb the water, keep the good stuff, get rid of the bad stuff with as little water as possible. Okay, again, here's these processes that we've already mentioned filtration, reabsorption, and secretion. Let's don't forget that filtration takes place at the renal corpuscle, takes place at the glomerulus, and this is simply removing fluid and solutes from the bloodstream, right? Not just moving waste, but it's moving fluid and solutes, good or bad. Reabsorption is what we're going to do to the good stuff. Don't forget, reabsorbing means to regain water and nutrients and ions back into the bloodstream, right? So we talked about going from tubular fluid out to the paratubular fluid and then into those paratubular capillaries. So those three steps are basically reabsorption. Now we've got it back into our bloodstream, and we can keep it and reuse it. And section is the opposite. So reabsorption, we wanted to do with the good stuff, water and, and nutrients and ions. Secretion is what we want to do with the bad stuff. Again, secretion is removing waste from the bloodstream and putting it into the tubes into the renal tubules so it is removed with the urine. So again we're taking waste from the blood and we're putting it into the renal tubules so it will become urine, right? Become part of the urine. So here again secretion is what we do with bad things that didn't get filtered and we still need to get rid of it. So again let's talk about that. We take it from the paratubular capillary into the paratubular fluid and then secrete it into the tubular fluid and now it's on its way out with the rest of the urine. So here again, here is that image. This is a good one. If you want to hit pause and take a picture of this, take a, take a screenshot, whatever, and study this because this kind of gives us a lot of the basics of all of our parts and really that's kind of the goal of this chapter is to make sure that we know what all these parts are doing. Now, as I mentioned, all the parts have very specific processes. Each part has a function. And so when we look at this, we can see that, again, the renal corpuscle is where we have filtration, where we have absorption and secretion are at the renal tubules. Most of the water and nutrient reabsorption takes place at the proximal convoluted tubule. Here, this is a mistake. Secretion takes place at the distal convoluted tubule almost primarily. Okay, so mark out proximal. Secretion is at the distal, so most reabsorption is at the proximal and the loop of Henle. And then distal is secretion. A loop of Henle, remember, super concentrates the urine, so it concentrates more than other places. And then we have the collecting duct or collecting tubule, sometimes called the collecting system. This is what truly does this function, the final volume and solute concentration. So loop of Henle, we should have pulled it out, put it up here, and said that it super concentrates urine, and then just added that collecting system so that it's the final volume and solute concentration. Again, there's that image, and it's kind of showing you all of that. Now, here let's talk about this renal corpuscle real quick. The renal corpuscle is where we're going to have the glomerulus in the Bowman's capsule. And the renal corpuscle is the, our main site for filtration. And so the renal corpuscle is going to be very important for that major event of um, filtration. Now, filtration, we go through, we go out of the um, actual 
uh, glomerulus, and this is referred to as glomerular filtration in our textbook. So don't be confused. It's the same thing. So whenever we're looking, we can kind of see how this information starts on page 967 and going over here on the page 968. When we look there, the filtration membrane are the layers that the fluid and the solutes go through in order to get out of the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule. So the filtration membrane is actually the membrane where filtration takes place. Okay, this is our net, in other words. So we do have the endothelium and the capillary of the glomerulus. So capillary endothelium, in our textbook it says endothelium of glomerulus. And then we have something called the lamina densa. And really all the lamina densa is is just the basement membrane of the glomerulus. And that's what it's listed in our textbook as, is the basement membrane of the glomerulus. And again, that's just the bottom layer the lamina densa, and then we have this layer of cells that's going to lay on top, and let me show you this in a picture. We're going to have these cells. Notice right here is their nuclei, and then we see how they've got all these feet that hang out, and the feet interlock almost with feet from the other one, but what they create are these filtration slits, and so the filtration slits in our textbook, it talks about the cells, it says the visceral layer of the glomerular capsule. So this is actually the cellular layer. And so again, think about it as visceral and parietal. And so the actual lining on the surface of the glomerulus are some cells, but what they create are called the filtration slits. These are the tiniest things to have to fit through. So here's the key. If you are small enough to get through the filtration slits or get out through this visceral layer of the capsule, then you will become filtrate. You will be coming out of the bloodstream. And here, this is not specifically correct. It is everything smaller than, not but, Everything smaller than plasma proteins. Filtrate, we're going to keep the plasma proteins, our albumins, our fibrinogens, and our globulins in the bloodstream. And we're also going to keep our blood cells, right, our formed elements. So if you're smaller than the plasma proteins, which puts you in the nutrient and waste range, then you're going to be exiting. You're going to become filtrate, okay? Now, so here we can kind of see that if you're small enough to fit through these slits, then you're going to enter Bowman's capsule, and now you are filtrate, and you're going to head out through that PCT. So what drives this process is pressure, is blood pressure, actually. And so similar to capillary bed filtration, how we've got to push out with hydrostatic, and then our old textbook called it colloid pressure instead of osmotic pressure. Here it mentions osmotic pressure as well. But remember, it's hydrostatic versus osmotic. Hydrostatic wants to push out of the bloodstream and therefore into... Bowman's capsule. So hydrostatic pressure, the main one that we're talking about is GHP, glomerular hydrostatic pressure. And this is the pressure, the blood pressure in the glomerulus. Okay, so it's simply just blood pressure like our other hydrostatics. And the key is that this is what drives filtration. This is what moves fluid and solutes out of bloodstream and into Bowman's capsule. But just like we saw when we were doing capillary filtration, hydrostatic wanted to push out, blood pressure wanted to push out. But due to the colloid, due to the blood colloids, the proteins in the blood, osmosis creates a pressure that goes opposite of hydrostatic. So because we've got more proteins in the blood, water wants to follow those proteins. It follows whatever, follows salt, follows protein. So osmosis is created by following that protein. So now we're trying to push against GHP. So I need for you to know that BCOP or blood colloid osmotic pressure or the osmotic pressure in the blood is against hydrostatic. If hydrostatic is a plus, then BP is a minus, osmotic is a minus. And so the whole key here is if we're trying to filter, then we need more hydrostatic than osmotic. Because if we don't have more hydrostatic than osmotic, then we don't push out of the bloodstream. And so filtration pressure, filtration pressure is a total measure, it's a measure of the total pressure involved with filtration. And here's really kind of 
the key. Filtration pressure must remain positive or else you enter renal failure. If you don't have positive filtration pressure, then you're basically hitting renal failure, and that's not a good thing, right? So this filtration pressure, super important. you got to have more HP than OP to filter. If we don't, then we don't filter, and that's what we refer to as renal failure. Now, we can measure per minute or per hour, usually it's per minute, how much filtration is made at a glomeruli, at the glomerulus. And so we call that glomerular filtration rate, right? So this is a measurement and this is kind of also an indication as to are the kidneys functioning properly? Are they removing the proper amount of fluid per minute in order to create the proper amount of urine with the proper amount of waste in it? So we use glomerular filtration rate um, to figure that out. And so you're not going to have to calculate a glomerular filtration rate. I'll make sure of that. But that's simply just kind of process that we can use to figure out that um, that how much filtration is actually happening. Now, as I said, if filtration pressure drops to negative, then you're going to enter renal failure. And I know that's tough to see in the background, sorry. But when the kidneys are unable to perform their usual excretory function, when they can't remove the urine or the uh, the waste from the blood and create urine, then that's when we're in renal failure. So obviously, as filtration slows, we're going to start to build up. We're going to start to retain rather than excrete things like water. So we're going to start to become edemic. We're going to retain waste. Definitely not good. We're going to retain ions. If we keep the salt in, then we keep the water in, right? Because water follows salt, and that's something we'll talk about in our next chapter. And so this renal failure, now you're building up instead of getting rid of. One of the things that's going to be affected quickly is pH. If we affect pH, then we're going to affect just about everything else involved. And so fluid balance, this is something that I just mentioned dealing with the ions in the water. But besides that, all the rest of this is due to pH changes pretty much in a nutshell. Your muscular contractions, your nervous system. Right? You're going to start to see seizures and delirium and coma. So we're going to start to have issues with both the muscular and the nervous system because pH is going to be all wacky and the ions are going to be all wacky. Metabolism overall is not going to be moving in the right direction because we've got too much waste. And so we're going to have overall metabolic problems and that's going to include digestive problems. So as I said, we're going to have some neurological effects. And that could lead to death, obviously, and that's not a good thing. So here, again, is a chance for us to talk about acute versus chronic. So acute versus chronic. Don't forget that acute is a quick-acting, fast-acting, um, rapid onset. Chronic is a gradual degeneration. I know sometimes it's kind of counterintuitive, but if you think about this, which one of these can you actually help fit as it's changing, as it's getting worse? And that's going to be chronic, right? Because acute might come on so fast that you don't have enough time to try to fix it. And so then you may actually may actually die from an acute renal failure. And this is where we're going to have most, most deaths due to renal failure is at an acute stage. Chronic renal failure, if it's slowly degrading, then that gives us the chance to slowly fix its function. Right. And I think we're all familiar with dialysis or hemodialysis as one of the fixes for chronic um, renal failure. So dialysis, I want you to be aware just what dialysis means. Dialysis refers to movement across a membrane. Movement across an artificial membrane usually is what we say. So dialysis is movement of anything, a fluid across an artificial membrane. What most people call dialysis is properly called hemodialysis, right? So we're, hemodialysis is moving waste out of, uh, waste and water out of bloodstream across an artificial membrane, right? So hemodialysis, we're actually taking some water and some waste out of the bloodstream outside of the body, right? So we're going to use an artificial membrane in that dialysis machine on the outside of the body, and what we're going to do is we're going to clean the blood. And so here's how it works. If you imagine a box with a line down the middle, so now we've got two chambers kind of, right? On one side uh, and in the middle, that line down the middle is going to be our dialysis tubing, okay, our dialysis membrane. 
And so on one side of the membrane, we're going to have dialysis fluid. And that dialysis fluid is going to be super duper low in every possible waste product, anything that needs to be removed from the body. It's going to be super low. On the other side of that membrane, we're going to have to tap into the body. We're going to put some giant needles called shunts into your arteries and your veins. We're going to take the blood out of the artery. We're pass it on the other side of that dialysis membrane and when we pass it that dialysis fluid is going to grab the waste out of it and so we're artificially moving waste out across that membrane because it's low in the fluid and high in the bloodstream so it moves high to low through diffusion and it takes place very quickly and so this waste is removed out through that dialysis well not very quickly but it, it happens as it passes through so in the time that the blood spins next to that membrane there's enough time to, to pull some of that waste out that's what I'm saying the process may take hours so it's not a quick process but overall at the membrane, it's actually taking place relatively quickly. It just takes a long time to do this. So after we clean the blood, after we take the waste out of the bloodstream as much as possible, put it into the dialysis fluid, now we can just dump that dialysis fluid. And that's equivalent of urinating, basically, one big urination. Um, we're going to take the clean blood and put it back into the vein through some of these shunts, right? So these big needles going in and out, that's definitely a negative drawback. We've definitely got the capacity right there to create infection very easily. If we keep putting giant needles in and out of your body, this is not an easy thing for the body to do. So we're going to see infection. We're going to see with removing blood, we're going to see uh, circulatory collapse possibly. We're going to see lower blood pressure, right? We're going to see, um, I just mentioned, it takes a long time, hours sometimes for dialysis to take place. And depending on how many times a week you have to do it, it's going to be extremely time consuming. Um, and your, your symptoms are going to show up in between your visits, in between your dialysis treatments. And so definitely there's a lot of drawbacks to this process. It's not, you know, completely a, a silver bullet right and the big problem is you're still losing your kidney function possibly and so the long term goal the long term you know not goal but the long term end game is going to be that you're going to lose your kidney function so the only way to truly heal to truly fix this problem would be to have a kidney transplant right so in order to get off of dialysis and to get the the body working and removing its waste normally then that's whenever we have to have a kidney transplant okay so dialysis it's really just kind of putting galls on a gunshot wound it's not doing much it's helping but in the long run if this is a serious issue then you're going to end up having to get a transplant to fix it now don't worry about diffusion osmosis carry meter transport these are some of the methods that we're going to move these these uh the water and then also all these solutes don't don't worry about that um i Here's what we talked about before. At the PCT, we reabsorb about two-thirds, as much as possible, of the filtrate. So what just came out of the glomerulus, of the renal corpuscle, we're going to grab two-thirds of it. We're going to reabsorb all nutrients as possible. We're going to reabsorb as much ions. Don't worry about active versus passive. That would be diffusion versus carrier-mediated. This one's active. This one's passive. Don't worry about that. I'm not too concerned about that. But the facts are that we're going to have reabsorption of ions nutrients and water, right? And we're going to reabsorb two-thirds of all that stuff right here. As I mentioned before, we get it out of the tubular, into the paratubular fluid, and then into those paratubular capillaries, and now we've just reabsorbed. So here again is our PCT, and it just makes sense. Right after this corpuscle, we are highest in all nutrients, in all water, and all ions. So here, if it's high in the tubes and low out of the tubes, diffusion just pushes it out. So most reabsorption takes place here. Then we're going to enter that loop of Henle. Don't forget that what's happening at the loop of Henle is really concentrating the urine. So we're only going to get about a third of the filtrate here, but what we're really doing to concentrate the urine is reabsorbing as much water and reabsorbing as much salt as possible. And so the loop of Henley is going to super concentrate that urine by reabsorbing at more water and more salt. And if we got about 30% here and we're going to reabsorb a little over half, then that's going to leave us around 15% of that original filtrate reaching the distal. So by the time we get through the loop, 
we've already regained, if we had 50 gallons, then we've already regained 35 to, to 40 of those gallons in those two regions. So we're only going to have about, you know, 15 uh, you know, 15 gallons, seven and a half months, somewhere down in that range of what we're actually is going to reach down here at the DCT. So we've already regained most of that fluid, right? Now, here's where we see most of our secretion. As I mentioned, secretion, we may secrete some potassium. A lot of times we're at excess of for potassium in our body, but we're also, here's a place for us to fix pH problems, and we'll talk about this in our next chapter when we hit pH balancing. Um, here we see these hydrogen ions. If, for example, you are deaminating, right, if you're undergoing way too much deamination, well, that's eventually going to lead to an acidosis problem. Um, if you are constantly deaminating, you start to build up keto acids and that ketoacidosis. And so here is where, again, you're forcing your kidneys to work harder to get rid of not just the urea that you're making, but the extra hydrogens that you're making in this process. So then the, the kidneys are having to work overtime to grab these extra hydrogens and put them into the filtrate, which is going to become the urine, and that's a very easy way to do it. If we just add hydrogens into the urine, then we just upped pH without having to do hardly anything major, right? We just pee them out, right? So we add the hydrogens, it now becomes part of the urine, and we've just fixed our acidosis problem here through secretion. So again, this is just an example. There's other things, creatinine is something that sometimes there's so much of it that some of it has to be secreted. And so a lot of it is filtered, but some of it is secreted. And so here's where we can do some other secretion with some other types of waste. Uh, again, there is that image. It just keeps coming back to that image because that is obviously kind of the whole take home kind of thing. Um, when we're looking, the um, first off, the collecting system, collecting tubules, this is where water and solutes are, uh, water and solute loss is going to be controlled by some hormones. Again, the collecting tubules, this is our final urine adjustment. If we haven't done anything with this point, then we're kind of out of luck. We can't really adjust it because now we're about to send it out into the funnel system and out into that ureter and down to the bladder. And we don't really adjust it in the bladder. So here we're going to see some of those hormones working. And this is something that I mentioned before, that here's where we're going to see aldosterone and ADH. Aldosterone wants to conserve the salts, especially sodium. So aldosterone wants to reabsorb more ions, and ADH forces more reabsorption of water. And so especially at the DCT and the collecting system is where we see these acting. I've mentioned before how alcohol blocks antidiuretic hormone. And so here is where we see if we block that ADH, then we're going to increase the water in the urine because we're not going to reabsorb it. And again, if we block too much ADH and we keep urinating too much because we drink too much, then that's going to lead to extreme dehydration. And that's what that hangover is in the long run, is that extreme dehydration because you didn't um, you weren't absorbing the water that you usually would so you're not drinking a beer and then going and peeing that beer out that's not what's happening you're drinking that beer and the alcohol in that beer is inhibiting this ADH it kind of blocks that receptor and then instead of regaining the water you usually would then you let that water out so you can even kind of see if ADH didn't work what would happen all day, every day. You would constantly urinate, you would be constantly dehydrated, and have that terrible dehydration feeling of a hangover, right? I'm not too concerned about vasa recta. These are some blood vessels that head down into the medulla, um, so I'm not too concerned about that, so don't worry about that for the test. A couple characteristics real quick of urine, and then we're going to finish this presentation up um, because uh, after that, this is my last slide. So here, the urine composition, um, the pH, because we are, and we haven't talked about this yet, but we're going to use buffers in the urine to take those extra hydrogen out so the pH is not going to drop that low only about six we don't need it really low because if we urinate out an acidic secretion an acidic solution then we're going to burn our urethra we're going to damage the cells and that's not what we want so we're going to use some phosphates in the urine and that's going to help to buffer that urine and keep the pH close to seven it's only about six uh, I mentioned before it's 95 percent water only five percent of the urine are actual waste products and so 
95% water um, is another important statistic. I mentioned one to two liters a day. Here it says 1.2, so one to one and a half liters of urine a day. Again, that's about how much saliva you make as well, right? So we do need to drink a lot of water. Here, if we add all that up, we're getting close to a gallon, gallon 3.66 liters. And so we're getting close to a gallon, right? And so um, 1.2 liters of urine lost is pretty major right and so we need to make sure that we're drinking and then we're also using water for other things right so kind of interesting um when it leaves your body urine is sterile there is no bacteria in it if there's bacteria in it then obviously you've got a urinary tract infection um because you know because bacteria shouldn't be in your blood um and therefore it shouldn't be in the waste product either and so if we detect bacteria then there that is a indication of a uti real easy to detect um but urine is sterile, not to be disgusting, but this is why people mention that you can drink urine. Um, it's best to drink your own is what I've heard. I don't know because I've never drank, just to be straight up with you. I ain't never done that. But we've seen it on some TV shows like Bear Grylls or some of these other people. We saw it in that movie, what was it, 147 Hours, where the guy got his arm stuck and had to cut it off, um, and he drank his urine to stay alive. So, you know, it is possible because it is sterile. It's not something that you just want to do, though, right? It's not something, hey, Friday night. Right, let's just drink pee, right? That's not just something that you do, right? So, but it is possible, all right? So there, that takes care of everything for this urinary chapter. If there's anything else, I will add it to our lecture whenever we have our normal class time. All right, thanks a lot. Have a great day.